Now, though we've briefly mentioned one of the female Impressionists, which was Berthe Mar Marceau, uh, there was another, well, there were four in total female artists who showed at those eight Impressionist exhibitions. The most famous among them would be Mary Cassatt. Um, though she was one of four women, she has the unique distinction of being the only American artist to show at any of the Impressionist exhibitions. So she was born in Pennsylvania, even though she spent most of her career working in France. So she met in 1877, she met Edgar Degas, and he brings her into the circle of the Impressionists. Now, granted, this was always a bit different for a female painter who didn't have the freedom to move around the way that male artists did, especially to the sort of public, social, and city spaces that the Impressionists tended to paint. So like Morisot, um, Cassatt, to a great degree, painted the realm that was designated for women, which was the domestic sphere. Particularly after 1890, her works are almost all of women and children and the domestic environment, which is interesting. She never had children of her own, but just to put it into context, these works become popular also because by about 1870, um, the, the shifting tide had occurred on the idea of wet nurses. So we talked about wet nurses when we talked about Daumier and the third class carriage. Uh, it was increasingly thought it was important for women to take care of their own children instead of giving them to nannies and wet nurses. So these domestic themes also sort of fit into this position of where middle class women were in society. As an interesting note, the bottom central work, the girl arranging her hair that I'm showing you here, was owned by Degas, who was sort of a mentor to her, not strictly a teacher. Um, this was owned by her, and for quite a while, um, it was discovered in his house after he died, it was believed to have been a work by Degas. But instead it's Cassatt, but Cassatt working in a very similar vein. But when I decided to pull out a Cassatt picture to show you, I had to show you in the Lowe's, which is really one of the most extraordinary pictures that I am simply in love with. Um, just as a note, I mean, Cassatt, she had a fairly good measure of success as an artist, um, which, you know, that was also the fact that she was afforded some luxury because she came from a woman of fairly high social status. Um, but as I said, she could not move around the way the men in society would. She couldn't go and see these spaces that were so important to modern life with the same kind of freedom. Although one exception to this might have been the opera, and that is the setting for the picture in the loge. We are on the balconies that survive, that surround the central space of the Paris Opera House. And the Paris Opera House is extraordinary. It was a place of the utmost importance for the public high class social sphere. More of that building is given over to social spaces where people were meant to see and be seen than was given over to the actual performance. And so this is a very fascinating work where the, the subject is a woman very simply dressed. She's wearing all black with a single diamond studded earring. She's got a fan in her hand that's folded up. And we see her in this very close space to ours, leaning out over the edge of a balcony. She's got a little sense of um, empowerment and energy. She's not sort of leaning back in her chair. Um, we see her actually breaking out over the edge of the balcony. We see her body tense and leaning forward. And interestingly, this picture really is all about looking. And you can see right on the central axis of that picture, the pair of opera glasses that she looks through. Like Degas, there is this sense of the spatial dislocation. So just like in Degas, you have that white stripe of the table that, that's a little disoriented and flattening. We have the same thing here. We're looking out 
onto the curved space of the balconies in this sort of rounded room, but there's not a lot of context in the picture. We simply see these curving forms breaking into the edge of the plane marked by these strong verticals to create this very narrow space for the woman. So this is the kind of subject that we've already seen the Impressionists like, like Degas, who goes to the opera, Cassatt does as well. So public entertainment, like um, Renoir in the Moulin de la Galette also, um, is a very popular theme. And the manner in which she painted um, was very much in keeping with the Impressionist style as well. So we can zoom in a little bit and you can see how remarkable the painted surface is. Um, you can see the impasto on the surface, that three-dimensional application of paint, which you can note very clearly on her collar as well as on her arm. You could see that in some places we could see the rough weave of the canvas coming through, but we can always see the direction of the brush and the mark of the artist. So it has that hallmark of the quickness of the brush and the lack of finish that we associated with the Impressionists. But it, as I said, central to this whole image is this idea of looking. What she's looking at, we could talk about. Um, some think that she's looking at the performance itself. So very, very much with all of her attention focused on this performance. And the fact that her ear is so clearly shown might be that she's listening as well to the music from the stage with this intensity. But it's possible also that intermission has come and that the light from the central space means the chandelier has been raised and perhaps we um, we are it's been lit right and perhaps what we see is her looking at other people and very interesting if we look towards the background we see other people looking at her now this pic this is audaciously rough and quick so when you look at those, what, what you read as figures, these well-dressed people in colors and hats in the distance are nothing but the quickest marks on the surface. But as we look behind her, we see a man who's also leaning over the balcony with his glasses raised, looking at her. And so this picture is really interesting. It is about looking and we're we're participating as well now though she has some agency here traditionally the idea of looking in an artwork is an act ascribed to the male viewer um, she is looking and she might be looking at other people in this voyeuristic way um, but she is also the object still of the gaze so it is this wonderful duality of the woman being looked at and the woman looking and so we can see that she's not only being looked at by the man behind her now, but she's being looked at by us. We participate. And so she's really sort of sandwiched between these two gazes. So in a very interesting way, this picture is about vision and the act of looking, which is really what, in a much larger sense, painting is all about. Now, just for fun, I would like to bring up the idea of what this work reminds me of in a more modern context, which is of the Guggenheim. Now we're gonna look at the architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright. And if you've never been to the modern collection of the Guggenheim on Fifth Avenue, just north of the Metropolitan Museum, you have to. It's a wonderful museum, a round building audaciously placed into the grid of New York City with its central exhibition space being this stacked spiraling ramp, which is the main space for showing exhibitions. Um, I've always said whenever I went to the Guggenheim that it is the best voyeuristic spot in New York City, and maybe that I even know of. And you can even see from this picture that visitors to the museum spend time looking at the artwork in the ramp, but they are also watching the other people watch the art. And those curving forms of the space reminded me so much of Cassatt's picture and its sense of voyeurism that I figured I should share that with you. And you'll think about that, the idea of the importance of looking and the sort of odd anonymity of voyeurism 
when you're in the space of the Guggenheim. Now, although we talked about Manet as a realist painter and one of the most important of them, um, Manet was by many people considered really to be the impetus behind the Impressionist painters. After all, he had a tremendous influence on Monet and Degas, as we've seen, and he did continue to evolve in his own style. The work I'm showing you right now, which is a bar at the Folie Bergère, uh, was Manet's very last work. And he was already quite ill at the time that he was painting it. Like Degas or Cassatt here, we see this theme that the Impressionist favored of painting um, forms of entertainment. In this case, not the opera house, but another sort of high class expensive venue of this sort of bar space, which was also used for performances. So it was like sort of a music hall as well. There is this display of luxury in front of us that tells us we're in a high class environment. We can see, for example, um, bottles of champagne. We can see fruit on the surface, some clementines. And over here, that is actually a bottle of bass beer, which would have meant that, that Manet was showing the interest in appealing to um, British customers at the, at the, at the space. Um, this was a place of entertainments. You can actually see a trapeze artist sort of performing up here as well. But most of the picture focuses on the barmaid. Um, Manet, though he completed this work in the studio, actually brought materials on site to paint the barmaid from life. And she was a real person. Her name was Suzanne. Um, and so we see this image of this barmaid with this sort of melancholic expression very blank expression that maybe seems at odds with all of the lively sort of cacophony that surrounds her looking out towards the spectator in this very sort of disconnected way. Now you'll notice that behind her there is a mirror. You can see the sheen right on the glass, the sort of haze of the reflections or smudges, and you can see a gold frame that cuts across the bottom of the work. And in this way, we see Manet once again confronting tradition. The idea of putting a mirror in the back of a painting is something that existed since the Renaissance. Um, the famous work on the left, Jan van Eyck's portrait of Giovanni Arnolfini and his wife, was maybe the first that we know of to position a mirror along the back wall, which allowed the artist to include the painter and the spectator in the scene in its reflection. So for Van Eyck, it was a way to connect the space of the painting with the three-dimensional space that we live in. And that theme was continued throughout throughout the centuries. Um, in the 17th century, Diego Velazquez in Las Meninas painted a very famous court portrait of King Philip IV of Spain, where we see the painter painting the king and queen who are only shown in the reflection of the mirror behind. So traditionally, when a mirror is included in a work, it's meant to connect our world to the world in the picture and to make the space of these pictures and, and paintings contiguous to ours and clear. Which is why Manet's picture is so shocking. And that's because the reflection doesn't line up with what we see in front of it. It's very hard to understand where we stand, where the walkway that we stand on is, when all we can see behind us are figures with opera glasses, kind of like Cassatt's picture leaning on the balcony to watch a performance. When we look into the mirror, we also notice that the reflection is on this odd angle to the scene, very different from the one in which we're positioned. The woman looks out directly at us, presumably the viewer. In the reflection, she looks on an angle towards a man in a top hat. Who is the man in the top hat? It could be Manet. Maybe this is like Jan van Eyck, who includes himself in the picture, but only in the reflection. Um, but yet there's a lot of puzzlement here. That isn't, doesn't appear to be the same body of the woman we see in the reflection. 
Looking straight at her, she's very erect and upright, with a very tightly cinched waist and these very fashionable clothes. She herself seems like an object of luxury on display, much like the objects in front of her for sale. When we look from the side, she has a fuller figure, and she leans out towards the man, who, again, is sort of shadowy and just barely sketched in in the background. The truth of the matter is that bartenders were referred to, or barmaids, as vendors of drink and of love, and very often they were presumed to be prostitutes, in which case the woman could be offering herself as much as offering the wares that she sells in front of her, because though she's elaborately dressed, she's of a low social standing. She's a barmaid. Um, and an anonymous one at that. So maybe that is the implication of what we see in the right-hand corner. But why Manet chooses to be ambiguous about the space is up for interpretation. Manet understood perspective and could have made this look realistic. And perhaps he subverts our expectations and, and manipulates the angle in order to call attention to reality. In other words, first of all, this is not an extension of our three-dimensional world like it was for Jan van Eyck or Diego Velazquez. You know that for the modern painter, the painter is the flat surface. But it could also show that it, you know, it calls into question what is reality? Is she any more or less real than the reflection we see behind her? Now I want to show you our second American artist, though he is truly sort of international in his upbringing. And I think he actually claimed at one point that he was from Russia because he did not want to be from Massachusetts, where he was born. So he was born and he spent his early life in Massachusetts, where his father was um, an engineer working for the railroad, where, at which point he got a job, the father, working for... Um, a railway in Russia. So then um, Whistler spent a section of his early life in St. Petersburg, then with his family in London. And that's before he returned to the United States where he studied at West Point before joining the US Navy. Then finally went to Paris for training before he ends up in London where he spends much of the rest of his career. So truly an international artist with a lot of different influences. But we really can think of him, though he was not of the impressionist orbit, like we saw with these other artists who all exhibited and worked together, that he is very similar in terms of some of his inspirations to an artist like Monet. And yet a little bit different. I think you're going to enjoy this. This is an incredibly famous work called Nocturne in Black and Gold, The Falling Rocket, um, which was the subject of a lawsuit. So this was an incredibly controversial work of art. And we've seen controversial works of art already. This actually went to court. So it went like this. We know that when art, ex art is exhibited publicly, we've got critics who are making comments about it. And we've seen the comments that were made about the works of Manet or the works about Degas, for instance. So there was a British critic named John Ruskin. And when this work was exhibited, um, this is something he wrote. He said, for Mr. Whistler's own sake, no less than for the protection of the purchaser, Sir Couts Lindsay, ought not to have admitted works into the gallery in which the ill-educated conceit of the artist so nearly approached the aspect of willful imposture. I have seen and heard much of cockney impudence before now, but never expected a coxcomb to ask 200 guineas for flinging a pot of paint in the public's face. So Whistler sued the critic John Ruskin for libel, and it actually went to court, and we have the transcripts of this event preserved. Now, the picture of the falling rocket is a fireworks display. And this is Whistler here on the stand. So he's asked the question, what is your definition of a nocturne? I have perhaps meant to indicate an artistic interest alone in the work, divesting the picture from any outside sort of interest which might have been otherwise attached to it. It is an arrangement of line, form, and color first. 
What is the subject of the nocturne in black and gold? It is a night piece and represents the fireworks at Cremone. Not a view of Cremone? If it were a view of Cremone, it would certainly bring about nothing but disappointment on the part of the beholders. It is an artistic arrangement. It is as impossible for me to explain to you the beauty of that picture as it would be for a musician to explain to you the beauty of a harmony in a particular piece of music if you have no ear for music. Now, the idea of music was very important for Whistler. Now, Whistler talks about this in his own writings, but it's in the title of the work. Titles are very important. And he gave his works these titles that were usually in two parts. The first part is called Nocturne in Black and Gold. The second part, The Falling Rocket. The first part of Whistler's titles usually have a musical term like nocturne or symphony or note or composition, right, or harmony, and then a list of colors. Okay, and again, this is very much in keeping with Monet said. He's not painting Camille, he's painting the colors that, that hit his eyeballs. So here he's referring to this simply as this nocturne in black and gold. Only after do we get the idea of the falling rocket, which tells us that it's a firework. So when we look at it more clearly now with those eyes, we can see not only the falling rockets, the firework, but perhaps figures down by the water, we can see the surface of the water and reflections and smoke and maybe maybe a, a cliff that we're looking towards. It's all very indistinct. And we've seen this before in Monet's water pictures where it's very impossible to see the difference between reflection and substance and smoke. Here, the idea that he's chosen fireworks shows that interest in the ephemeral, like we saw with Monet. Fireworks are instantaneous and he's attempting to capture them in an instant with the splatter of his paint on the surface. But the musical analogy was even better for Whistler because it really calls attention to how abstract this composition is. And he explains why he talks about the relationship between painting and music. He says nature contains the elements in color and form of all pictures as the keyboard contains the notes of all music. But the artist is born to pick and choose and group with science these elements that the result may be beautiful as the musician gathers his notes and forms his chords until he brings forth from chaos glorious harmony. He was criticized at the trial for charging so much money, this 200 guineas for a picture that had took him only a very brief time, a day or two to paint. And when he was asked, you charge that much money for that little time? And he said, no, I charge it for the knowledge of a lifetime. So there's that idea that the color, the form, these are all notes and the painter has the ability to group them and turn them into something beautiful. Now, Whistler ended up winning his trial, but he was awarded a farthing in, and he had to pay all the court costs. And a farthing is like a half, it's like a penny. And so he basically went bankrupt as a result of pursuing his sort of principles here. Now, you may have heard of Whistler before, and he was famous for painting also many portraits, which he also gave musical titles, as in Arrangement and Gray and Black, Portrait of the Painter's Mother. So that's a famous, you ever heard of Whistler's Mother? There she is. Now, all of these pictures have some of the features that we've been talking about, the sort of flattening of the picture space, which becomes very important even since the time of Courbet. But now it's important time to talk about why some of that is. And so I want to talk very briefly about Japonisme, which is the idea that artists at the time were basing some of their works off of the aesthetics they were seeing in Japanese art. And that's something that's said very often of Whistler's work, particularly of the falling rocket. Now, 
When we talk about Japanisma or the influence of Japanese art on these 19th century modern painters, it has to do with politics, interestingly, of its time. So in the 1630s, the Japanese government banned its citizens from traveling abroad, and it also restricted far access by foreigners into the country of Japan. So they only had one international port at that point, which was Nagasaki, and only Koreans, Chinese, and Dutch could enter that port, and they even then couldn't travel freely around the country. So beginning in the 1630s, up until the 1850s, there was very little contact between Japan and the West, in Japan and Europe. However, that changes in 1853. So between 1853 and 1854, Commodore Matthew Perry and American naval forces um, got trading and diplomatic privileges established with Japan and forced them to open up more of their ports. And so as there was increasing contact between um, Japan and between Europe, there was more trade and objects begin to travel. And some of the first objects that traveled freely and quickly were images called um, nishikie, prints. So I'm showing you an example of a Nishikie print on the right hand side by Suzuki Haranobu, who was considered really to be the sort of founder, um, the perfecter of the Nishikie, which really just means it is a polychrome woodblock print. So Nishikie was a technique of using a woodblock print, which is a relief printing technique in different blocks, each to apply a different color. So the technique of doing this and aligning the different colors was something that Haranobu um, experimented with in the 1760s and perfected before his death. So he made about 600 of these Nishikie prints. Um, the good thing about Nishikie prints is that they were cheap because they were works on paper and they were mass produced. So they were affordable works of art for the kinds of people who would not have been able to afford a painting. Now, because they were the sort of pop culture kind of art and they were meant to be inexpensive and affordable, they also explored a different set of subject matters than traditional painting did. And so we refer to this kind of subject as yukioe. So yukioe literally means images or pictures of the floating world. And what that means, floating worlds, means tra the transitory world, right? Something that is impermanent and fleeting. So yukioe prints often have to do with subjects of entertainments. They have sort of low subjects or hedonistic subjects of things like courtesans or kabuki actors or travel scenes, scenes of city life, wrestlers, again, the kinds of things that we wouldn't normally see in um, important high art, but that becomes sort of appropriate here. And Yukioe prints were incredibly appealing to 19th century artists at this time of modernism because they presented a visual alternative to the Western tradition. And the Western tradition since the Renaissance has been all about three-dimensionality. Well, these prints offered something else. There's areas of flat color without modulation, so you don't see light and shade. The figures are um, rendered in a way that looks very flat and linear, and this was appealing, as were the subjects, because these subjects of entertainments and modern life and low characters are exactly the things that the Impressionists and even the realist painters were pursuing. So just to show you the influence, now this is a very overt influence, you can see Whistler's picture called The Balcony, variations in flesh color and green. Again, highlighting the fact that this is about color as opposed to about the subject, though the subject um, is very similar in these two works. And you could see Whistler is basing his work on a composition like Haranobu's if it wasn't this work itself. By the way, Haranobu's picture shows two women, one standing upright with a musical instrument, the other two are um, probably 
courtesans, but they're they're kneeling down and they're playing basically what I have found out is this fox game is basically the Japanese version of rock, paper, scissor. And it's basically like the hunter, the fox, and the rifle. And it has the same arrangement as rock, paper, scissor. And you can see that there's like sake on the floor in front of them, which will function if someone has to drink when they lose. Um, this is really the, the sort of impetus, so the inspiration for Whistler's work. Of course, Whistler's work is very different. There are some very overt, obviously, references to Japanese culture. We see four women who are dressed in Japanese robes. They've got a Japanese tea set in front of them. They've got fans. And they've got that same three-stringed musical instrument called the samisen. Um, the woman in the floral robe has that we see the standing woman in Harunobu's picture. <clears throat> We also see the figures set inside on this balcony with a sort of high vantage point. We could see in both pictures the railing jutting across the back edge of the picture. Um, in each picture, we could see the artist's signature. Over here, you can see Whistler's, which was uh, an image of a butterfly with a sort of long tail. And you could see Harunobu's here as well. Um, and you can see um, the presence of these sort of flowers, which in each case sort of break spatially abruptly into the picture. So in Whistler's, they're on the bottom edge, and in Harunobu's, we see them coming up over the wall of the balcony. Okay, so obviously these pictures have a lot in common, but it's more than that. Um, Harunobu's picture is very flattening. Again, the loss of modeling, the perspective is very confusing in this picture. We see the floorboards angled back into space, and then we read what should be an upright wall, right? Like a, a wall like um, Whistler's, but it has angled lines on it too, which are meant to confuse us as if this is a continuation into space, and in which case this wall is set further back, or is this an upright wall? And we're not allowed to see because we have this upright standing figure who blocks the juncture between this screen and this wall. So it's hard to say if the wall only exists back here or if the wall exists throughout the space. So it is spatially ambiguous. Um, in Whistler's picture, we have a similar arrangement of horizontals and verticals, which sort of lock the figures into place as we see here. Um, and as I said, you have the way these pictures jut into the space, not letting us know really where they are. Where are we? Is this a tree? Is it a bush? And how is it positioned here? Which is very similar to this here. How high up are we if we're on the treetops? And is that where we're supposed to be? Whistler's picture is a little bit more three-dimensional in the background. But even this is supposed to be um, a reference to the art of Japan. We are, the figures here are actually, this was painted um, from the artist's own balcony overlooking a Chelsea riverscape. Um, and this is an industrial slag heap. This is an industrial harbor that we're looking at. And yet, the artist is very purposefully referencing the forms of Mount Fuji, which were sacred to the Japanese. So the reference to Japan is not only strong with sort of the obvious things, but also in terms of the style that Whistler is purposely flattening the space. Positioning thing like his signature on the picture plane his signature is a two-dimensional element oddly placed on this three-dimensional space, which calls attention to the flatness of the surface. And just so you know that this interest in Japanisma is not something that is just related to Whistler or just related to overt copying of Japanese prints, but we see it throughout the Impressionists and the post-Impressionists as well. So, for example, we looked at Degas the Tub. That spatial disconnect is something we see in a lot of Japanese works of art. Um, but also the subject of bathers, 
um, and with these crouching bathers as well, is something that is in Japanese painting too. And in fact, this particular print was owned by Degas, which shows you that they're getting their inspiration not just for style, but also for subject matter. And so you know that even an artist like Monet, who claims that overall he's just copying his absolute visual experience, he too is pulling references directly from these prints, in this case from Hokusai, which is even a more modern Japanese artist who, I believe it only died in the 1850s. So here you could see one of Monet's early pictures, the terrace it's on a dress, which he paints um, when he was destitute and he left Camille like pregnant in Paris and went to go stay with his family at Saint Adresse. And this is always seen as a very sort of personal view of Monet. And again, you can see very distinctly the references to types that exist in Japanese art with that purposeful flattening of the space. And it's actually quite fun. If you want to look through Monet's pictures and Hokusai's prints, we again and again can find inspiration that Monet seems to have taken. So no matter how much the artist is saying my work is purely visual, every artist is tied to the artistic past and as well to sort of modern cultural influences like what was happening with the influx of Japanese prints. And in mentioning Monet, I would like to come back to him for a moment because for much of the 1870s, Monet was in terrible shape. He'd commit, he attempted to commit suicide once. He was despondent. At one point, he refused to show anything at the Impressionist exhibitions because he said he had nothing worth showing. His fortunes and the fortunes for many of the Impressionists began to turn around in the 1880s somewhat as they started to get more collectors and people who were interested in their work. But it's in the 1890s that things become very big for Monet. And it occurs, oddly enough, with the work that I'm showing you here, although there's more to the story than that. Um, when this work was exhibited, the critics for once didn't bust out laughing, they didn't criticize it, they didn't call it unfinished or as showing a lack of talent. A critic called it a revolution without gunfire. That's a big, wonderful statement. What we're looking at here is the facade of Rouen Cathedral, the portal in sun. It's a work at the Met. Um, what, what Monet does in the early 1890s, about between 1892 and 1893, is he rents a studio in the city of Rouen across from the facade of the cathedral. And the cathedral is just a French Gothic building. And you can see the angle here is just about right. That's a sort of contemporary picture. And he begins to paint the facade. Now you remember one of the biggest problems for artists was as an artist like Monet, somebody who wants to paint an immediate impression, is that the landscape is always changing. You can't paint as fast as you see, and you can't paint before the lighting conditions change. And so what Monet figured that he could do is he basically had these boxes, slotted boxes with canvases in them, so that he could look out the window and say, okay, it's 8 a.m. and sunny, and he could choose the appropriate canvas, only working on it until the light had changed, you know, basically working at the window so he could be as close to en plein air as possible. And he would work, and when the lighting would change, he could work on a different picture. And so he created these images that were very much of the facade at different times of day. Now, the choice of Rouen Cathedral is really kind of interesting. I mean, French Gothic architecture is sort of a national symbol of France. It's one of their great treasures and part of their nationalistic identity. And yet, in characteristic Monet style, he's not at all interested in what makes this building Rouen. We can't see any of its religious sculptures or its stained glass windows. All we see is that thick impastoed paint and he translates the forms and the lines of the architecture into color and light. So on the surface, it seems like he's doing what he'd always been doing. 
And so it's hard to imagine why all of a sudden the critics viewed this as a revolution. But I can tell you why. Monet didn't exhibit one of these works. He exhibited a large group of them. He made quite a few. I think at the first exhibit, he exhibited maybe 20 or 25 together. And that was the revolution. And this is an example of Monet's serial paintings, which he begins to do of things like haystacks in the 1890s. So he painted Rouen Cathedral not once, but over and over again, changing the picture depending on the lighting, the weather, and the time of day. Now you can see these are not really necessarily faithful representations of what he sees, but you can see how interested he is in the color of the light reflecting off the whiteness of the stone. And that was the revolution. So why? And I'll tell you something, this was my formative moment for Monet. So I had never appreciated Monet enough until I was in London in the 1990s. And there was an exhibition up of Monet at National Gallery. And I agreed to go with my friend, but we went first thing in the morning before it was crowded. And I went in and I saw a room full of these all together. And I said, I get it. I get it. You see, what Monet figured out how to do is that if he could paint the same subject over and over again, the subject disappeared. It became the control. And what this was really about was the variable, the thing that keeps changing, which was the light. So he figured out a way how to paint the cathedral, but make the subject be light and time. So it was genius. And we could see that this is really a step towards abstraction, which we'll be talking about in the early 20th century, even though the subject was something so embedded in the past. So now we're going to look at our very last work this unit, and it really is one of my favorites, which is Auguste Rodin's The Burgers of Calais. Rodin was a bit of a late bloomer. Um, he could not get into the Beaux-Arts school when he applied. He was rejected time and again. And he ends up learning sculpture from some local artists. And he also travels to Italy where he studies the works of Michelangelo and Donatello. Um, he does not exhibit publicly his first work until the age of 37. And he's over 40 years old when he receives his first major commission, which was this. So the town of Calais, which is a port city in France, wanted a public monument to celebrate a famous historical episode, which was from the Hundred Years War, when England under King Edward III was at war with France. So between 1346 and 1347, the city of Calais was under siege by the British, by, by land and by sea. And eventually, after 11 months, they were forced to surrender. And Edward III was angry because of all the trouble the people had caused them. And he wanted the people executed, exiled, driven out. But instead, um, his advisors pled and they argued that it would be better to sort of exact a tribute from the people of Calais and that they should send six of their most important citizens to be executed. And these were the burghers. So the people of Calais held a meeting to determine what they should do with this offer. And eventually a man named Eustache de Saint-Pierre, who is the bearded man that you see in the center over here. And he volunteered that he would go and then five others followed. According to the historical records, they were dressed in sackcloth, they were made barefoot and they were supposed to carry the keys of the city to the camp of the King of England. This is the scene that Rodin decides to depict. Now I want you to know, these are, so this is, this is a very emotional moment. He shows the people of the camp um, in a way that the patrons at Calais didn't really know what to do with. Let me explain. So Rodin would have made a model. Once he had awarded the commission, he made a model and said, this is what I plan to do. And the people of Calais who ordered the statue, this committee, were not very happy. This is what they said. The committee said, this is not the way we envisaged 
are glorious citizens going to the camp of the king of England. Their defeated postures offended our religion. The silhouette, the silhouette of the group leaves much to be desired from the point of view of elegance. The artist could give more movement to the ground, which supports his figures, and could even break the monotony and dryness of the silhouette by varying the heights of the six subjects. We feel it is our duty to insist that Monsieur Rodin modify the attitudes of his figures and the silhouette of his group. See, originally they wanted just a triumphant statue of Eustache de Saint-Pierre. Rodin decides to show all of the figures, and instead of showing them in a triumphant way, heroic, proud, willing to self-sacrifice in order to save their town, he shows them in various states of despair. They're also complaining, first of all, that Rodin did not want to put the statue on a pedestal, and he put all of the figures on the same ground plane. Like, in other words, a boring composition that's sort of monotonous, as we saw in the realist painting of the burial at Ornan. The figures are all just lined up in an unorganized fashion. Rodin replied, and Rodin said, I have not shown them grouped in a triumphant apotheosis. Such glorification of their heroism would not have corresponded to anything real. On the contrary, I have, as it were, threaded them one behind the other, because in the indecision of their last inner combat which ensues between their cause and their fear of dying, each of them is isolated in front of their conscience. So there is this attitude of realism in Rodin, but we can talk about him in terms of Impressionism as well. Now Rodin studied these figures first in clay, right, which was a traditional medium for a sculptor, um, would model the figures first in the nude in his studio. This is Pierre de Wissant. This is one of the other major figures. They're all historical people. Then he would have studied them in the nude and then at once they were cast and then cast in bronze with clothing on. You'll notice that the surface of the statue is almost impressionist in its quality, a very rough sort of flickering surface. He doesn't make the form smooth. It's kind of like what we saw in Degas, but he leaves sort of the surface very variable so that it reflects the light in a shimmering way, which almost has a sort of flickering quality to the surface. And he studied each of the figures in such a way that they really read as these different stages of grief. And again, they're not heroic. It's Eustache de Saint-Pierre who looks maybe the most stoic or the man beside him. But the other ones are shown in anguish. They're questioning each other. And here you really can see that flickering, very active, dynamic surface that we can associate with Impressionist painting. Bronze is a reflective surface, and so the variations of the surface really play with the light. But most important for this work that really made it novel is that Rodin eliminated the pedestal. Um, pedestals were important for works of art. First of all, they announced that a work of art was important. They even announced that a sculpture was a sculpture. A sculpture went on a pedestal. Even Degas' statue went in a vitrine. It goes in a case. But Rodin wanted this statue to interact with the people. He didn't give these figures period clothing. You don't read them as being 14th century figures. And he wanted the viewer to be able to walk into the space of the sculpture, to, to walk around it to look at it from different views, to participate, so that it becomes this very active and in that way much more effective viewing experience. So it's sculpture, and so it's a little bit different than looking at the Impressionist painters. But his idea here was to take something historic and bring it to everyday life, um, which was radical and novel for its time. Now, some of you are saying to yourself, but wait, I've seen this work of art and I've seen it where? I saw it in London. I saw it in Los Angeles. I saw it in Philadelphia. No, I saw it in New York at the Met. No, I saw it in Washington, D.C. I saw it in Tokyo. I saw it in Paris. Well, we talked about this with Degas, that after Degas had died, his work was cast into multiple versions. 
Well, after Rodin's death, it was determined by a law, there was a law passed that basically determined that up to 12 copies could be cast of any one of his existing works in clay. And the first 12 would be original Rodin's. There can't be 13. 13 would not be original. Only 12 could be made of each. I mean, it's, that's arbitrary. It's sort of fascinating because there's no material difference between 12 and 13. But that was what was determined by law. Eight of them were to be sold, four of them were to go to cultural institutions, though they're now almost all in cultural institutions. So just again, that idea, the version in the Met was never touched by Rodin, um, but it is considered authentic as Rodin. So I am going to leave you there. That was a lot of Impressionism, but I feel like you now have a wonderful base to see what happens in the weeks going forward.